Oh, response video into Contavod, I guess. Um, subject of absolute truth. And uh, he's been playing with this totalitarian word. He likes to associate with some sort of absolute. Um, so I guess the first argument I make on totalitarianism and uh, say mob rule is that, yeah, it comes in lots of forms, right? Without government, we're still going to have majority mobs. Um, we're still going to have people with power, people without power, and they're going to still exert pressure for certain behavior. So you could, uh, you could argue that uh, the un-totalitarianism gave us things like slavery, where it wasn't some government action that imposed slavery, it was government inaction, uh, giving people the liberty to create industry around the buying and selling of people. Um, so they were given the freedom and uh, they used it as just as much of a totalitarian mechanism as some sort of enforced law. So it's just sort of a sort of an idiotic not to recognize that there's going to be in position no matter what you choose, there's a, there's a, imposition is the nature of our existence in a sense. It's, you can't live on this island um, without imposing on each other. And so we're just trying to find the best mechanism, the best definition of the rules of imposition, first off. Um, and ideally, um, a philosophy or a grounding set of knowledge that establishes um, rightness, not just majority rule or not just some, some arbitrary mechanism that defines uh, validity or quality, but to establish quality through some uh, process grounded in logic that might give it some sort of credibility as a um, something you've based your, your totalitarianism on. Um, yeah, I mean, you just can't avoid the subject of arguing uh, the truth in the sense of it can't, you know, the truth, the, the thing being established by the word absolute isn't that necessarily we have it. Again, you, if you wish to argue we don't have enough information, I think you have to argue that by demonstrating something real that we don't understand, first off. But let's say you're going to argue that. It's okay, but there's still a best guess. You can't, you can't take away the fact that there's a distinction between these fables, these stories of reality. And uh, if you want to argue that evolution is just as much of a story, a made-up story, as Jesus Christ, well, you go ahead and try arguing it, but I think it's a an insipid, uh, vacuous. Um, you could only do that by lying if you're a reasonable person because the evidence is so overwhelming. But these are stories that have nothing in common in terms of the authenticity or credibility of their sources and even their logical continuity. There's no logical continuity to um, psychotic, almost, gods blackmailing and extorting and cruelly manipulating, <laughs> you know, uh, ignorant little animals. Um, it's disgusting on its face. It's, uh, the behavior is um, unintelligent, just grotesque, um, unprogressive, un... Uh, <laughs> it's, it's something intelligence wouldn't resort to. Intelligence doesn't resort to totalitarianism. Intelligence attempts to resort to persuasion, argumentation, um, do it the graceful way. Uh, there's efficiency in that grace. Uh, and then, uh, but, but what compounds this? So, so, so let's not, you know, I mean, yes, the word absolute can come up in the conversation. It doesn't matter whether I'm arguing for an absolute truth or the best truth available. I mean, that we, we have to resort to the best truth available. You want to you want to change the word absolute to the best truth available? Well, go ahead. I think you're playing a silly semantics game. 
Um, but if that avoids the accusation of uh, totalitarianism because you do what logically makes sense and what you can logically defend, um, obviously criminals can't logically defend their behavior. You know, so quit pretending the behaviors are all equal. Not all behaviors are equally logically defensible by basic premises of establishing certain truths. Now, we know that Hansel and Gretel and Sleeping Beauty and Red Riding Hood are not compatible stories. They're not, they can't all be true. So that's the, the premise here. The default has to be something coherent um, and it can't be some, well, the truth is all, all stories are equal and all stories are true. Well, that's not the truth. They're either all wrong or one of them is right. But you're, that's, the, that's the truth of the matter. That's the truth we can establish is that made-up stories that are fundamentally incompatible cannot both be true. And you start from there. You start from that premise that they aren't all equal, uh, that they do have degrees of rational and logical integrity, and we can tell the difference based on um, you know, which ones are likely or less likely to be the truth are in the direction of the truth. Uh, they're going to be close to the truth. I mean, you know, and so, but anyway, so he just plays this cheater's game where he keeps wanting to associate truth with tyranny. And uh, there's nothing tyrannical about efficiency and doing the right thing and preventing harm. It's not a tyranny to prevent a rape. It's not an imposition to prevent somebody committing a crime. Uh, it's the truth that these are not acts of tyranny and oppression. Um, and it's just a, you know, a slander against function uh, to sit there and imply that these things are equal, that the act of the criminal uh, is no different than the act of the defender. Wow. <laughs> wow, that was a hell of a, a beehivey. Glad it didn't fall on me. Look at that. Huh, nothing inside of it. Oh, gee, it's right under the tree of death. <laughs> it was a trap. The bees put it there to trap me. Ah. But I didn't fall for it apparently on that deck. Might be seeing the little saws and they cut the rest of the tree down. And they just didn't make it. Anyway, see that's a story. It has no hope of being the truth. But you know that the bees are sitting back there with the little saws sawing the tree. Now there's no hope that that's reality. That's the truth. And there's every hope in somebody saying that's the story. When somebody says, that's a story you made up, they're speaking the truth. There's every probability that is the truth. The absolute truth is, I made that fucking story up. It's a fact. We can glean facts and uh, sensibly impose them. All right, I'll be back. Go for a run. Oops, changed it. I hate that. Anyway, semi lovely day, but I just couldn't give a crap. <laughs> yeah, just having a. Anyway, until next time. Oh, back. <laughs> Very crunchy. Um, probably too crunchy. Yeah, so. Anyway, find a better spot. Yeah, I'll just find a better spot. Logic. The logical thing to do. Efficient. Um, minimize losses. Uh, you know, back to the helmet paper. It needs a tree. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, <coughs> yeah, let's sit here. There's a little spot, a little poo there, a little tiny poo. Some kind of animal. Anyway, um, it is uh, quite nice out here. Uh, it is quite nice. Um, so back to this uh, absolute value. Um, but again, best guess value. 
uh, most logically credible value equation. And uh, clearly, <coughs> imposition is the nature of the game. Um, life is imposing. Uh, it just is. It's by its very nature. It, it's, uh, it crowds on top of itself. And there's no... Um, the actions you take implicate others. It's just a fact. And some of them more than others, of course. But you, as soon as you <coughs> act in a way that's going to influence somebody else, the subject of ethics and morality is initiated. And it's just plain wrong, irresponsible, um, criminal to avoid the obligation to think about that, those eth ethical implications, to consider them, and to fairly evaluate uh, the appropriateness of what you intend to do in terms of imposing. And this certainly goes for subjects like procreation. It's overtly aggressive, overtly impositional. It is not happening to you. Birth happens to somebody else. I am not either my mother or my father. Um, so it's just inaccurate, crazy, silly if they have some notion in their head that having babies meant they imposed on themselves. Because they didn't. They imposed on me. Uh, they had the expectation that I would say, oh yes, lovely, lovely, it's all okay. Go ahead, kill some six-year-old kids with cancer. It's all okay because I saw pretty colors. It's not okay, not good enough. I wouldn't pay that price for the pretty colors. Um, I'm not interested in being obliged to continue to play the price forever and ever because somebody else says so. Um, because they impose. So clearly not imposing means not playing. And uh, that's just the truth of it. To not impose is to not play. And as soon as somebody else starts playing, they start imposing. And you have a right to impose on them to stop them from imposing. Just as you have a right to stop a rapist from raping, or a murderer from murdering, or a, anything doing harm from harming. And the ethics is absolutely logically visible. Absolutely coherent, sensible, both to intuition and deep logic. It just makes sense period, to um, <clears throat> maximize efficiency, and to do so based on a reasoned hierarchy of credible choices. Your choices can be ranked based on their likelihood to produce um, the absence of, or a, a lack of harm. <laughs> you know, to negate harm. And uh, they can. They can just be ranked. <clears throat> and that ranking is um, kind of absolute in the sense of uh, there's something at the top and something at the bottom. The thing at the top has this sensible probability outcome. You have to go with the probability. You have to go with the rational, logical deduction. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, this is just, to pretend that you can't see any of that, any of it, and that's what Antikhanovat is doing, is abolishing all of it, and then pretending he's not, by saying, wait a minute, there are conditional circumstances where I will tell you <laughs> what's worth preventing, but I'll let you know what those are, and I will not be obliged to defend them, or I will pretend that I'm going to defend them with some kind of absolute knowledge, more absolute than yours, <laughs> you know, which is just so silly.
the same logic uh, that makes you capable of seeing the imposition of rape can make you see the imposition of procreation. The logic isn't any really different. Uh, it's uh, the same observational mechanism, the same perceptual devices being used, um, and the basic uh, <coughs> distribution of outcome <laughs> is what's being evaluated uh, and sensibly decided that it's not worth the price. <clears throat> the bad outcomes outweigh the value of the good outcomes. Period. You don't do it. Okay. Probably enough. Um, yeah, so <clears throat> obviously the word absolute sounds aggressive, sounds like permanent marker, you know, <laughs> like permanent. It sounds uh, dangerous. <clears throat> and then, but it's just the sound. Uh, the truth of it is, the absoluteness is a logical conclusion. You have to go with the best guess. Whether you want to call it absolutely true, or the best guess at absolutely true, <laughs> or the absolute best guess at absolute true, it's semantics. It's a word game. Uh, there's no difference in the fact that resorting to a default is retarded. Your obligation to act exists because not acting is acting. If you let something bad happen, not much better than making it happen, if any better. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. I don't know if I need to add. Maybe when I go inside a place in this video, just to throw it on at the end, but no real point. Just a lot of words, a lot of run around to basically say, I know what's good and bad. You're a tyrant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm a good imposer. You're a bad imposer. That is, you know, I have sex. You're a rapist. Um, it's such a double standard, a hypocrisy and a duplicity. He's perfectly willing to impose, but he wants to impose strawberry ice cream. <laughs> you know, he wants to impose his flavor of the truth and say somehow he's not doing it. He takes no responsibility for being exactly the same uh, as everybody else in terms of playing a game. Um, and so he's just playing a game. <laughs> with the idea that we're playing a game. Cheating the language uh, to make it sound like there's something different between his tyranny and my tyranny. Now, what there is is the difference in the logic we use to justify it. Yeah. Yours being mob nonsense, mine being logical continuity with observed and established, well-established uh, fact. I can't go this way. Keep forgetting. <laughs> yeah. uh, I gotta cut that tree. Tomorrow. And tomorrow. And tomorrow. And tomorrow. I'm very bad at this tomorrow thing. Everything's tomorrow. And, uh, shit. <laughs> yeah. It never, tomorrow never gets here. In terms of really getting anywhere. Ooh, scared the cat. Um, yeah, sorry. This went on further than it's supposed to have. Now yeah, we'll look at my asparagus ferns again. This is their charming. You like them. Uh,. <laughs> yeah, something likable about an asparagus fern. Anyway, enough. So, 
few little flowers here. Yeah. Roses and whatnot. Anyway, until next time. And the key, where to put the key? Here it is. Maybe if that's. You know, here's somebody over there. It's the plumbers here. Be back. And such. Until next time. Alright, back inside. I'll play a little bit of this just for the hell of it. And uh, we're gonna. Yeah, wow. Well, you call somebody who not only believes they have access to absolute truth. Okay, so that's another way of saying, you know, access to absolute truths or um, the elements or the, the evidence of a conclusion. So, yeah, so he's, he's, he's going to call somebody a name because they say, yes, my fingers have fingernails. And there's no reason to say my fingers don't have fingernails. But they also believe that thus having such access to absolute truth, they are then equipped or entitled yeah, so let's say once you've uh, drawn a conclusion, a solid conclusion in your mind about the fact that your fingers do have nails or that rape is wrong, that you would um, do what you can to um, exercise or act on that knowledge. So um, what do you call somebody who sensibly sees somebody drowning, uh, draws a conclusion that they're suffocating to death, and they might rather have a popsicle instead, um, or even have their hiney rubbed, um, that there's a lot of things they might rather do, and that you can elevate their condition from suffering and drowning to having a popsicle with very little effort, let's say. And that you say, yeah, I'll do that. Or you're just standing there, and there's a fireman over there who, you know, who has a sign on him saying, I really want to jump in the water. And you say, look, you could jump in the water and save that guy. How about doing that? That's how much effort you have to extend. What would you call somebody who does that? Yeah, sensible. To impose that absolute truth on others. Right. <clears throat> Again, the, the absolute truth of rape is wrong. Um, name any one of our reasonable social laws against violence and brutality and harm imposed on other people and um, he's going to call that some sort of imposition where his selfish impositions based on his selfish notions of entitlement those somehow aren't impositions overriding the objections of others overriding another alternative theory of truth Right? So the objection is coming from an alternative theory of truth, that there's somehow some mitigating force that's saying, no, do not save the person drowning. He's a rapist. He's a child molester. Now, if they can give you evidence that that's the truth, then, yeah, you'll say, okay, yeah, let's let him drown. But if they can't give you evidence, if there's no indication that that's the truth, then you do override their objection. And you say, shut the fuck up. You're in the way. Yeah. Um, at the very least, I would call that person a fanatic. So, <clears throat> you're a fanatic if you've recognized a few rights and wrongs in the universe about, uh, especially things like suffering. If you think it's good to mitigate against uh, unnecessary or wasted suffering, suffering that doesn't need to be endured, it's easily prevented, most importantly prevented. Preventing is the, about the best thing you can do is prevent a harm. Um, then you're a fanatic. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, let's play a little more of this. I'll jump around. Um, but the problem is, of course, I think the Western way of thinking... Oh, well, we don't need to do that nonsense. <laughs> the Western way of thinking... You know, this whole generalization, you know, claiming some sort of right to your individuality in the face of you keep resorting to these generalizations. I mean, what, what is that? How can you claim some right to object as an individual to some totalitarian force 
when you keep claiming that everything's run by a totalitarian force, that everything's part of some totalitarian entity, that everything's thinking like a Westerner, thinking like an Easterner, or thinking like a something else in her. You're pretty much a pedestrian clicheist. <laughs> yeah, how about that? Yeah. ...on that idea. It's more... It, it is... Definitely has an, an idealistic element to it. Strongly idealistic. But it's an idealist... Idealism that I find is sort of... Shot through with realism. <clears throat> Some people say the French are almost too realistic. Oh, here we go. So now it's the French. And, the, you know, isn't that the joke? So he's still, you know, two and a half minutes of this... Let me generalize about people and call you some kind of thing, like a French man, or a flat-headed man, or a long-haired man, or a blue-eyed man. You know, and I will now pigeonhole you into a philosophy and claim that's what you have done. You were Adolf Hitler. You were this. You were that. You were this. Because you thought drunk driving was bad. I mean, what a crock of crap. Experiences of a lot of clarity. Um, because if your worldview is contingent upon a right and a wrong existing out there, i.e. an absolute truth... <clears throat> Rights and wrongs existing. Um, and yes, that you're convinced beyond, you know, you're going to need one hell of a pile of evidence to show up to undo the evidence that exists. You're being convinced by substantial evidence maybe even your own personal experience, having experienced suffering, you say, yes, I understand suffering be bad, and it be bad for anything conscious. And, uh, you know, say if you've had the piano f dropped on you and you've survived, from that experience you might learn that, yes, having a piano dropped on you absolutely sucks. And um, I'm certain that if there's nobody who needs, you know, would, would say, I want, it would be a fun time to have a piano fall on. So there's no need to have any complex philosophical discussion because you have an obvious and, and um, high probabilistic, a high probability of accuracy in your conclusion. Um, you're in for a nasty shock when you're confronted by things like relativism. <laughs> Yeah, well, whatever. So, again, so he's telling you what you're in for um, when he's the one claiming he's the one who doesn't know what the truth is. Um, confronted by relativism in what form? In what shape? And in his video, he does cite a bunch of as if because history got it wrong, and history has been slowly evolving progressively into a new philosophy, that that means we're always wrong. And so it's that same old dodge. He sees no linearity to the development of ethics in the human organism. So he doesn't see that we abolished slavery and gave women rights and um, have progressively evolved an ethical code that gets to try to get that tries to get more and more just to this idea of prevention and this idea of correcting things as soon as possible and all of that kind of thing preventing the unnecessary harm, that that isn't the fundamental nature of most of these ethical codes, is to prevent unnecessary harm, to sacrifice unnecessary indulgences, to prevent unnecessary waste. The regulation of, say, nuclear power plants isn't just for the fun of it. The idea is to regulate them so they can't make mistakes that are going to be detrimental to the masses. That's the idea of it. That's the function of it, the purpose of it. But he'll claim there's some other purpose, that it's some ignorant purpose from the past when people were free to own slaves, free to beat their wives. Sit and be, we can't impose it on other people. It's, you know, gentlemen of the jury, what do you, how do you find the uh, defendant? Guilty or not guilty? <laughs> Um, it's not gentlemen of the jury, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, or people of the jury, whatever they say nowadays, speaking of PC. Um, did the defendant do it or not? <laughs> What's the difference? I mean, clearly, the, the point of the trial is to find out whether they are guilty of something heinous for which there should be guilt. Um, 
for which there is an, an accounting required. It's not just a matter of whether you did you rescue the damsel in distress. No, that's not what we're asking when we're having a bothering with a trial. We don't have trials to figure out whether somebody's been a hero or not. We have trials to figure out whether somebody's been the opposite of such a thing. And there's no point in calling, there's no reason not to say guilty of the crime charged. There's an accusation in the charge that the crime has been committed. Not just an action, but a crime has been committed. Um, and so just evidence, more evidence of the semantics. He just lays all this in this word play. Games, playing games with words to try to disengage from this, the obvious truth that there is an ethical truth out there to be had, that we have acquired many of them. We have understood that uh, you can't win by enslaving your own kind, that that's illogical. Maybe not for moral reasons, or, you know, when I get when I think about it hard, morally, should this person go to jail or not? Well, morally, who knows? Who, who can tell what this person's moral makeup is? Um, Again, well, again, why do we, you, you know, we, we're not making moral edicts. We don't put people in jail in the West anymore, in any of these civilized countries all of Europe. We don't put people in jail for thought crimes or crimes against Allah or crimes against Jesus Christ or God or some sort of notion like that. We put people in jail for crimes that are socially destructive, that have social consequences. So, again, what, you're, just, you're still not on the, you're still not talking the truth. The, the, the criminal justice code is not a morality code anymore. There's very few places you go to jail for a moral crime, a crime against a God edict. You're, going to, you're getting convicted of a crime against social order, um, social efficiency. But there are other reasons to put people in jail. Get them off the streets. Um, enforce the social contract. Um, keep the streets safe, or... Well, and none of that is written by some sort of absolute understanding or some sort of grotesque confidence, some high degree of confidence that serial killers will do society no good if set loose. Yeah, I think that's a high degree of confidence that people can have that a somebody who has raped and murdered somebody is not probably somebody who's not going to rape and murder if you let them loose protect him from himself or give him a couple of years to stew in there until he figures out that you know you can't go around behaving like this or <clears throat> well again it's not a matter of can't right it's a matter of understanding why you shouldn't shouldn't why you shouldn't so it's just knowledge and yeah they should be teaching them something while they're in there not just hitting them with a stick saying no don't do that we won't have a society to live in. Um, so again, he's definition of a society. He'll tell us what is enough of a society. He'll tell us when you're passing too many laws and it's not an appropriate law because that's too much of a society. I don't want that much society. So again, he can be arrogant and obnoxious and, and pontificate on what is or is not worth it. And yet if somebody else does, they're a tyrant. I mean, it's just too fucking convenient, isn't it? It's just nonsense is what it is. Absolute Nietzsche, Randian, crazy fuckery. Yuck.